can't think as people do. The machine is different. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dyer Observatory. Let's see, what would Winnie the Pooh say? It's a blustery day? Yeah. Uh, so last night we had 21 mile an hour winds. Tonight they're predicting 31, um, 31 to 18. So you should be safe. If we feel you're not, uh, we'll have everyone go into the uh, building so it will be secure. Uh, but. Uh, even in our 50, 60 mile an hour winds earlier in the year, the only thing it did was rip out this panel at the top. So we're not going to get nearly that high of a wind. But anyhow, I want to tell you a little bit about Dyer Observatory. We've been here since 1953, and we're absolutely thrilled to have this partnership with the Belcourt to do science on the screen. Part of our mission is bringing scientists to the public, and tonight we have a wonderful, wonderful guest. Uh, actually, he's a uh, part of the family here at Dyer Observatory, Dr. Odell, and uh, he's, he's the rock star of astronomy. He probably wouldn't admit that. He's running to the library now, so he won't have to listen to this. Uh, but anyhow, you, this is going to be a great night. Um, we have summer camps for rising 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. We also do rentals here at Dyer, a lot of weddings, a lot of corporate events, and it helps pay for our summer camps. So if you know of anybody that is interested in science in that age group, please get with us later. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Allison. Oh, yep. Can you tell the story last night you did about how it got started? Okay, well, uh, Dyer Observatory was started by the vision of Carl K. Seifert. He was an astronomer. Uh, who did some work in galaxies, energetic galaxies that have a bright core. Now we know that those galaxies are feeding and the black hole is uh, having stuff fall into it. Uh, but they call those Seifert galaxies. He came to Nashville, became the head astronomer, and he had this vision to have an observatory in Nashville. We had a little one down on campus, but it was in really bad shape because of all the coal dust in Nashville. And so, he, his good friend, Jack DeWitt, you may have heard that name, Jack DeWitt was president of WSM. Jack DeWitt was a, uh, an outstanding fellow in his own right. He was an, uh, an astronomer, built telescopes. We have one of his telescopes upstairs, as a matter of fact. And uh, he was over Project Diana in World War II, and they were the first folks to bounce radar off the moon. And some would say that's the beginning of the space race. He was an engineering genius, and a lot of the equipment that uh, Nashville is known for uh, its music, and we're Music City, a lot of the equipment that skipped that signal that enabled uh, the Grand Ole Opry to be heard in Chicago and down in Florida, Jack DeWitt built. But he was interested in astronomy, and those two guys got together. Carl Seifert said, I would like to have an observatory here. Jack DeWitt said, that's great. I want a weatherman at the station I'm starting called WSMV. And so... Carl Seifert went over there part-time to be their weatherman, and every night he would talk about astronomy facts when he gave the weather. And so as a result of that, the Nashville community got behind it. Um, there was a fellow named Arthur Dyer who built bridges and uh, barges and ships. Uh, as a matter of fact, the steel in the dome that houses the telescope and the one in the library is ship steel hull from World War II. It was left over on his lot. He was building Liberty ships and barges for the war effort. So they went over to um, Arthur Dyer's um, house. Arthur Dyer had a sundial he'd commissioned, but he didn't know how to set the darn thing up. So uh, Carl Seifert, Jack DeWitt, and Arthur Dyer had a few adult beverages, set the sundial up, and Carl Seifert said, I want an observatory. And Arthur Dyer said, I'll help you get that observatory. And so here we are today as a result of those three men and all of Nashville. So who's going to make a documentary about Dyer Observatory? That's, I love that story so much. It's so Nashville. Um, so thank you, Rocky, and thank you. Um, this is Vanderbilt University's Dyer Observatory, and um, we are so happy to be here. I'm Allison Inman. I'm the Belcourt Theater's Education and Engagement Director, and I want to welcome you on behalf of the Belcourt. Thank you. Um, this is, I want to welcome you back to Science on Screen. We are very excited to be um, doing Science on Screen for our third year, um, and I've, I'm sure a lot of you have come back before, but who is at Dyer for the first time tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, well then, can I see who's, who's been here before? 
Okay, that's, a, yeah, okay, well, good. This is my first time this week, and I think it's incredible. But this week, the Bell Court is one of 19 cinemas around the country who are showing films about science-related topics of some sort and presenting them with a notable speaker from the world of science, technology, or medicine. And, of course, we are so thrilled to have Bob O'Dell with us. I'm going to bring him up in a minute, but I have a few other announcements to make. Um, this um, grant that we received to do Science on Screen is from the Alfred P. Sloan De Foundation and the Coolidge Corner Theater in Brookline, Massachusetts. It's such a creative program where cinemas like us have the freedom to show any film that we wish and have any kind of conversation that we wish. And we've done some creative, beautiful things with it before. This kind of tops them all for me to be out here at Dyer um, Observatory. So thank you all um, for being with us. It's, it's an opportunity for us to partner with, our, with the scientific community at Vanderbilt, but also this program is very successful because of you, our audience, who have supported this so enthusiastically. Tonight, of course, is sort of a spillover sold out show. We sold out last night and, and y'all sold us out again tonight and that's great. That might not be the right way to say it, but thank you all for coming out here. And I'm, I love the weather. I'm not worried about the wind at all, Rocky. I think it kind of adds to the drama as long as we're all going to be safe. But um, so as I'm sure all of you know, the Bell Court is an independent nonprofit cinema that opened in Hillsborough Village in 1925. We are currently closed for renovation since December. Um, it's going really well. Um, we're, it's a major renovation, first major renovation that's been done to the building in 50 years. Um, and our uh, reopening this summer, everything's on schedule. I don't know when yet. We will let you know as soon as possible so you can come celebrate with us and get back to going to the movies. We miss seeing y'all all the time. But the capital campaign is still going on. We're aiming to raise $5 million, and we're at $3.95 million. Um, you can give at bellcourt.org um, at any amount. We've just got a new level now where you can give and have a name, have your name on one of the seats. So if that interests you, bellcourt.org. If you've already given to the capital campaign, thank you so much. And, and thanks, as always, to any of our donors, any of our members, and anybody who just buys a ticket and comes to see our show. We appreciate you very much. So we have a few other pop-up screenings before we reopen. I'm just going to tell you about a couple of them. We're showing another science on screen film, Embrace of the Serpent, which you'll see a trailer for. Um, showing that April 3rd at Third Man Records, two screenings. Um, and I think we have a special guest speaker for that as well. And there's a free screening that's happening on April 9th at Casa Asafran. And I want to tell you about this one because it relates to our education program. Um, this is a documentary by Mary Mazio about um, a group of Latino um, boys in a high school in Arizona. They're undocumented, and they build an underwater robot for a, a prestigious robotics championship. And the film talks a lot about using science to solve problems and also talks about their um, issues as undocumented teenagers. The Belcourt Theater and Conexión Americas received a grant from National Council of La Raza to, um, to undertake a, a workshop with some teenagers in Nashville to empower Latino youth um, specifically to solve problems in their community using science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So we did this program a couple of weeks ago at Glencliff High School with 30 students who are immigrants and refugees, um, newcomers, very, relatively new newcomers, um, who spoke many different languages. It was really challenging and a, just a beautiful transformation happened when these kids um, were broken into teams and they identified problems that they wanted to solve and did presentations on how they could use science, technology, engineering, arts, and math to solve a problem. Much like the kids in the film, this is a group that I can tell a lot of people don't believe in, and they really proved themselves. They're going to be at this screening of the film on April 9th at Casa Asafran, and I just hope you can come so you can sort of see what we're doing with our education program. I'm so proud of these students. That's a big part of what we do um, at the Bell Court. So, thank you. I appreciate that. So on to our evening. We're so excited to be showing again our heavenly bodies. This is a film from Walker, um, Hans Walker Kornblum. Um, he was born in 1878, and for some reason, I just really like to think about a film about, um, about space um, from someone who was born in that year. Um, the film was made in 1925, and it was made as an educational film to talk about what we knew about space at that time, the universe at that time, and then also to sort of imagine what might be possible. Um, and it's 
really cool and a lot of fun. And it has subtitles. And if you can't see them, we tried to make the chairs that the, the floor is flat. But if you can't see, just shift around. And we've got the front row open. You can stand in the back. It's kind of a challenge in a room like this. But to bring the film to life, we are so happy to have live accompaniment tonight from Coupler. This um, group is so awesome. We have Ryan Norris, Rodrigo Avendano, and Rollam Haas. And they're amazing. And it just really makes it for a magic evening. And we loved it last night. I can't wait to hear it again this evening. So after the film, we'll have a Q&A with our guest speaker, but I want to bring him up here tonight to just say a few words. But he is the Distinguished Research Professor of Astrophysics at Vanderbilt University, um, but he's also the founding project scientist um, for the Hubble Space Telescope, and he oversaw the construction of that. So we're so honored. Please welcome Bob O'Dell. Thank you. You're going to enjoy this. It's a great film. It's up to date. Of course, the date was 1925, some 91 years ago. It was really up to date at the time because German filmmaking was concentrated in a place called Babelsberg, outside of Berlin. And right next to it was Potsdam the home of the major observatory in Germany. So Kornblum brought in really good astronomers to advise him on preparing this film, and it shows. It was like having Caltech located in Hollywood. We're going to see the results of that. A few of you are amateur astronomers, I know, and you may be thrown off by unusual terms, historical terms like fixed stars. What's a fixed star? Well, what it is, is something that's not a planet, the sun, or the moon. It's a 2,000-year-old term. You may be thrown off by, by that. The German speakers may have and, and the audience will have trouble because you're seeing things written in old script that went out of date before any of you were born. So sit back, enjoy the show. Let me warn you that there will be a pop quiz <laughs> during the question and answer period. Namely, the question is, what fundamental law of physics is violated in the film. Okay, we'll find out your answers at an hour and 33 minutes from now. Yeah. I want to welcome back the founding scientist um, of the Hubble Space Telescope Project, Bob O'Dell. Bob. Thank you so much for being here. And the Belcourt's um, Programming and Education Associate, Zach Hall. And you all get the conversation going. Oh, also, Goethe died 184 years ago yesterday. Okay, who caught the basic law of physics that was violated? Times the speed of light. Okay, and for that, the correct answer, you're going to get, get free tickets for you and your family <laughs> and all your friends for the rest of the year. <laughs> she say, she's saying no. Okay, yeah, you get my admiration for catching it. And, I, and I know that I'd like to think that you're all Belcourt members and you know that the prices are right there, and so you don't need to get free tickets there <laughs> because it's a great place. Any more que yeah, any let's, questions? Let's get some quick questions from the audience. Just raise your hand and yell it out because we don't have our wireless mics as usual. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the escape velocity 
So he's saying like a lot of the calculations in there were really spot on, some were like way off. He's curious about the escape velocity that they mentioned in there. Uh, that, that was certainly understood at that time. Uh, the advisors to the film were all people who were dealing, uh, astronomers who dealt with celestial mechanics. They understood that part of it quite well. So those, th those things were rendered very, very accurately. But the business on this, the uh, speed of light uh, is a different matter. But did you notice in that, that same act, they, he went over, they wanted to see what was going on back at home, and he went over to this round thing, <laughs> this television that was on the wall, Fernseher, the same word in German as it is today for television. So they were projecting that in 1925. It's I thought that, that was very uh, good on their part. Yeah, what I, just from like a heady point of view and just from my own point of reference, if you were to aim a television <laughs> or aim something that's retrieving television signals as you're going the speed of light or close to uh, away from the source, what would that even look like? It wouldn't be in reverse, would it? <laughs> well, if you were smart enough to build the television, you'd be able to correct the, for the, the frequency sh shift. But there is one thing uh, about the um, film that was right, and it is interesting, because when you look at distant objects, you do see what they were like when that light was emis uh, emitted. So something like the Hubble, is basically a time machine where you're see, actually looking back in time and seeing what the universe was, was like then. And they got that right on the money. So while we have you here, just really quickly, because I, I, just for my own personal reference, you worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. You were like the lead project scientist, right? Yes. You were responsible for naming the Hubble te Space Telescope? Sort of? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, so this is like a major object for, for outreach, too, right? One of the things we talked about last night with this movie is how art and how depictions of science and sort of a more creative way influence us, uh, you know, norms, us non-scientists, to sort of inspire us to think that this is a worthwhile venture. It, 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 it must have influenced people in 19... Kids, in particular, in 1925... I know that when I got interested in uh, astronomy as a grade school kid in the uh, late 40s, that was because of all these beautiful pictures that were coming out from the Palomar 200-inch telescope. <laughs> and I th expect that there are, are uh, people being influenced by what's happening with Hubble. Well, I mean, I, I, just speaking personally, like growing up with these like fold-out National Geographic colorized Hubble prints or whatever. Like, that's the reason I am this nerd that I am now who is able to appreciate something like that. And I think, like, that's the wonderful thing about something like this movie, something we were talking last night about Cosmos, this ability to inspire the layman in all of us, the scientist in all of us. That, that's, that's right. And I think he did a, a wonderful job. He covered everything in the universe in 93 minutes. <laughs> Now we know much more than we did then, and you couldn't possibly collapse all the today's knowledge into a film so, so short. Uh, because there are many more astronomers, a lot more is, is known. Yeah. But there's a lot more to be found out, so keep paying your taxes, and <laughs> Let's go view through the telescope. Yeah, so the telescopes are open up there. I encourage you all to go check it out. It's absolutely wonderful. See the real thing with your naked eyes. Thank you so much. Thanks to the Dyer Observatory for having us, and thank you all for sticking around. Have a good night.